Hello and welcome to another episode of the Book Baby Spotlight podcast from quarantine. I'm your host, Sam Sedan, and this is your home for conversations with authors, illustrators, editors, and other industry insiders from the world of self-publishing. Joining me today will be a book baby author and television writer, Eric Truhart. Eric's book is the medium-sized book of Zim Scripts, where he takes the reader through the creative process behind his first job in television as a writer for the animated cult classic, Invader Zim. Eric, thanks for joining me. Hi, Sam. How's it going? I'm honored to be here. Good. I've talked to a bunch of different authors on this podcast, but you're the first one that I know of who also was writing for television. So can you discuss a little bit about what that process is like? Uh, yeah. Um, I Well, it helps if you start writing for television and then become an author, because uh, that makes it way easier. Um, but I have been writing for animated television for, oh my God, has it been 20 years? What have I done with my life? Time oh has my no meaning anymore. God! <laughs> I have to go. No, uh, yeah, I've been I've been writing for animated television for uh, many many years, and was uh, always asked uh, when I go to some convention uh, convention appearances to sign something. And I thought uh, having a book of scripts would be a nice little thing that that fans of Invader Zim, which was the first show I ever wrote for, uh, could take with them. And then in the process, I ended up writing a book that is much longer than I had anticipated because I got into the stories behind them and all sorts of insider stuff uh, on working for Invader Zim. So I hope that answers the question. I'm not sure it does. <laughs> all right. Well, let's go back to the beginning. How, how did you end up writing for Invader Zim? Uh, I ended up writing for Invader Zim almost entirely by accident. Um, it was my first job outside of film school, and I had managed to snag a manager, which uh, is tough, and I also man- who managed to snag me an agent. And I had expected to be writing for some sort of, you know, high-profile uh, avant-garde live action. I didn't know what. I just, you know, wanted something big. And then somebody called me up from my agency and said, there's this show on Nickelodeon, um, we're going to put you up for it. And I was like, Nickelodeon. Oh my, this is, this is so not me. I was very young and arrogant. Um, but I went and they said, it's by this guy named Jonan Vasquez. I'm here. Why don't you read some of his comic books? And I, that weekend I'd gone North on a trip, started reading his comic. was like, well, this could be very, very interesting. And it turns out it was, um, you know, I, got this job having no other experience on an actual TV show. And I think that uh, may have helped me get the job. Um, but um, as it turns out, it's been one of the landmark uh, jobs I've had in this business. And it's the one that's followed me most closely throughout the the rest of the years. So if our listeners aren't familiar with the show, it certainly has a unique tone. Uh, the main character's primary objective is to enslave the human race, after all. Uh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yes, that is true. <laughs> so how did you go about sustaining that tone? It seems like it could easily get too absurd, too dark. Was that something that you consciously worked on? Um, you know, it, a lot of that tone was set. And by further, for you listeners who aren't familiar with Invader Zim, you know, um, well, first Google it. But and also I have a trouble to believing that actually you'd be listening to this if you weren't, because um, it's a show that's managed to collect a very weird cult following over the years. And so many people watched it as sort of awkward children or awkward adolescents and then carried their fandom into their adult years, which is kind of a, a, a nice achievement uh, and something I'm very proud to have been a part of. But and yes, it, I think no smart of the uh, no small part of the popularity is that it's got a dark tone, a dark and kind of cynical tone. But that's also very playful at the same time. I mean, for every quote horrible thing that happens, um, you know it's happening for a laugh, and it's also usually a pretty good laugh. Um, that came down to Jonan Vasquez, um, who's if you've read his comic books, uh, you understand how he really balances um, humor and uh, darkness. And as the guy in charge of the show, he sort of had final say over what got in and what didn't. But also, you know, just being in that environment with him, we all, you know, I think we all shared a sort of sense of humor, most of the staff on that show. And it came out in the in the show itself. There wasn't like 
people sitting around saying, you know, okay, only make moose jokes, do not make antelope jokes. There was nothing like that. There was no mandate of like, please make sure something explodes at least once every three pages. But, you know, like a lot of jobs as a TV writer, you find the you find the voice of the show, you find the vibe. And part of that is from working with the, the creative people that you work with. So it wasn't like a specific thing that we tried for, but I think it's part and parcel of uh, Jonan's point of view and his sense of humor. Described it to one of my colleagues uh, earlier this week as hot topic uh, ambiance. <laughs> There is some of that. Yes, uh, there's a little hot topic. There's a little, uh, you know, angry teenage goth going on in there. Uh, I think there's a little bit of a sci-fi darkness in there. Yeah, um, I yeah, I, I can't say it was deliberate. And also, like, you know, we didn't set out, nobody set out to, to create something that was going to sit on Hot Topic t-shirts for the next 20 years. It wasn't a conscious thing. I think Hot Topic saw the show and said, our people would like this. But at no point did, you know, they send spies out to Hot Topic taking pictures and bringing <laughs> them back. It, it was definitely the other way around. What uh, was the collaborative process like? Did you find that more helpful for your own creativity? Uh, the, yeah, you know, what was the collaborative process like? You know, when you work on a TV show, every TV show is a little bit different. But you're when you're sort of a hired gun, they hire you for your point of view and your ideas and your voice. But also, you know, you're working towards a common goal. Uh, you're not just there to, like, create your masterwork that and your genius is going to shine through on every level. So, um, but on the other hand, Jonan was really adamant about sort of letting people do what they did best and so the collaborative process is, you know, and I've outlined a lot of this is in the book, but like your job as a working writer is to come up with ideas. And so I would write, sit down and write like a dozen or more potential show ideas, which would get, you know, sent up the ladder. Uh, Jonan would see them and he would decide what ones we wanted to set forward, if we wanted to put tweaks in it. Um, and we would, um, you know, then it would go up the network ladder and the network would usually hate what we did um, <laughs> and come back to us with some very, very angry words for us and questioning just our, 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 our humanity, why we would eat. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, there was a real creative, there's a tension between like the creative side and the manager side, but we, you know, you'd write something, it would go through, you then, you know, get feedback, you'd write an outline, you'd to get feedback, you'd write a script, you get feedback. And unlike some shows, which I know are very writer's room driven, if you've ever like read behind the scenes of TV, it involves people sitting in writer's rooms for hours talking things over, sometimes rewriting scripts, you know, in a group, some, you know, always throwing jokes at the wall. For us, it was it was a lot more solitary. Like once I had my script, I would go back into my office. So I had to my assignment and sit there in the darkness trying to crank it out on time, you know, hoping mm -hmm. I could summon the enough darkness and jokes and and vile uh, no i'm joking um yeah but yeah it was a lot more solitary than other shows so a lot more of what you personally did sort of ended up on the page did you go the uh, the snl route when it came to pleasing the uh the upper management by you know putting your most crass ideas in there to try and sneak something through i i um i don't know if i should say. yes <laughs> sometimes Sometimes we would put stuff in there that we, we knew wouldn't get in um, because we wanted it. Uh, sometimes uh, we, a lot of what we did was in direct response to the things they were sending to us. Um, we weren't as, I mean, believe it or not, we weren't as calculated or cynical as some other shows I've worked on. And cynical is too strong a word. I have definitely worked on shows where the showrunner has socially engineered the executives when he's been like, okay, here's what we're going to do. We're going to leave this in up front. And then when we get, they're not going to even going to bother reading to like page 10. So we're going to put the other thing on page 10. And here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to send them about four scripts to give notes on like at the end of the day on Friday. And so they're going to have to get them. We were not that planned out. We were genuinely like sincere about trying to get our horrible joke about somebody's head exploding through. Um, but uh, there are plenty of examples of stuff that we did in sort of direct responses to um to the network not liking us and to be in their defense they they weren't irrational angry people they weren't like an ugly stereotypes out of like a 
80s comedy movie where you know the the fraternity rise against up against the oppressive uh college dean it wasn't like that at all they just they had a job to do and i think our sensibilities were completely different but uh yeah if for example in um in uh, uh the christmas special called the world's uh, the most horrible christmas ever we come back from break uh, the whole thing is framed by a snowman uh, telling the story to kids, this robot snowman from the future, and, uh, you know, comes back and from commercial break, and the snowman says, well, children, are there any questions? And one of the children says, I don't understand this at all. What does he have to gain? What does he have to lose? And the mechanizations of the Santa suit completely elude me, which were all network notes, um, <laughs> which are <were> all <laughs> paraphrasing of network notes. And at that point, the snowman grabs the kid by the head and, quietly pushes him under the bed and just keeps talking. <laughs> so that was how we addressed it, that little round of network notes. But, you know, on the whole, we tried to be good, uh, but we often failed. So you touched a little bit on the uh, the dedicated fan base, and I noticed that you took a few shots at them in the book. Uh, were you ever surprised by the level of dedication? You know, I, I, I'm, well, I'm not surprised. Well, what you've asked is two, two intertwined questions that I'm going to try to tease out, if I may. Um, one is about uh, the level of dedication, and the other is about taking shots at them. Um, I'm not, nothing in my book is mean-spirited. Um, I thought maybe if you read on the other side, you have a completely different opinion. Maybe it's horrible. I shouldn't have written this. I'm very sorry. Um, <laughs> we'll hit you up on Twitter. Don't worry. Yeah, okay, yeah. No, uh, I'm not surprised at the level of... Um, of passion, I guess. I guess I am because I'm amazed that it lasted this long. And we had this very sort of ridiculous little Nickelodeon show that ran for like barely two seasons. But, um, you know, you, they're no more crazy than other kinds of fandom. You know, if you look at you know Harry Potter, Lord of the Rings, Star Trek, Star Wars, you know, I think our fans are just a little bit weirder, which uh, can cut both ways. Um, but I, you know, weird is good, I think, generally in the world. And our fans are, are very weird. Uh, what I take pot shots at is the fact that, and I don't know how prominent this is in other fandoms, but there is a lot of information that circulates out there as facts, like behind the scenes and stuff like that, which is all patently not true. Mm -hmm. And a lot of like things that are just completely false end up on the Zim Wiki, which I do take a few shots at because I don't have access to the Zim Wiki to change it. Uh, I, I had to set the record straight somehow. Uh, yeah, a lot of stuff. It's amazing sitting on the other side. It makes you question just what you can believe when you read like insider accounts of like, you know, what happened on the making of Star Wars Rise of Skywalker, because there's so much out there that they say is true is not true at all. Um, so it's a both funny and frustrating to read. Well, that's a great point, because you uh, start off the book immediately establishing the unreliability of the narrator. <laughs> Uh, so you, you described the very assuming Nickelodeon building, which I'm sure we all remember from, you know, that that 15 second commercial back in the day. Mm -hmm. uh, very assuming building uh, and, and regularly undercut yourself you know, throughout it. So where did that idea come from? Of, of you know, of, of the the slow drifts into complete fiction during. Um, well, first of all, I'd like to say I think this I hope the slow drifts into complete fiction are very well labeled um, and very <laughs> obvious because I'm not out to, to lie or, or spread more more wrong ideas uh, than I do already just as a matter of course. But I think the fact is uh, a lot of it is because um, I think I get bored very easily <laughs> when recounting factual things and I find that. Uh, my comedy instincts just drift into madness as I'm writing things, and it's way more entertaining to, uh, I think, make up a completely fictionalized account of uh, how I got the pants story through than to actually dig out the, the truth of it. Um, when actually, by the way, how we got the pants story through in the book is not completely fictional, um, but, how I, but some of the things, I think I talk about uh, meeting Jonah outside a giant billboard, maybe, I forget. Anyway... Everything about Joan in there is made up, and I drift into fiction a lot, basically, because I think it's funnier. Um, so if something is not funny, it's probably true. Um, if something is, f or it was just a really terrible idea on my part, and uh, I thought it would be funny, it, it, it wasn't funny, 
Um, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm sorry it's not funny. Uh, <laughs> but I think the fiction stuff should be obvious. Did you uh, have to clear this book with Nickelodeon or any other rights holders? No, I didn't because this is so... At this point, it's so under the radar. Um, I didn't publish this with a major publishing company. I set out to self-publish this, which is where Book Baby, uh, to plug this organization, was absolutely invaluable. Um, I set out to self-publish this, and I say in big letters that this is unauthorized and uh, unofficial. And Nickelodeon has not contacted me to say a word about it, which makes me... Which is actually about on par with the level of neglect they've always showed the show after it's been canceled. So, um, you know, if they ever call me up and say, hey, you're in violation, we need you to stop this, I will have that conversation with them and say, well, you know, if you guys just want to publish it under your banner, I, I can expand it. And, you know, why don't, why don't, then you have a free advertisement for this show that, you know, you're trying to sell a home video ball. So if it ever happens, uh, if I ever get a cease and desist, uh, that's when the negotiations will start. But no, I did not ask for Nickelodeon's approval. I, uh, if I should have, I'm sorry to anyone at Nickelodeon who was personally hurt by me not phoning them up first. Um, it's not that I don't care about you. It is that I don't care about you. But <laughs> um, yeah, n no harm intended. Um, you know, if there's ever a problem, they can call me. Fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so you said you always intended to self-publish. Why is that? You know, uh, after, you know, doing a little bit of research around and, you know, talking to some of the publishing companies and whatnot, I, I basically started to get the feeling that I was going to have more success with this as something that I had control over its marketing and, you know, its content and sort of how it greeted the public. Then if I went to a publishing house where this would probably end up as honestly a minor title for them you know uh, publishing companies in general are driven by money because they have to be especially now if they want to keep their doors open and you know if they i knew that if they didn't spend a lot of money optioning my book or something they weren't going to spend a lot of money to promote it and i knew nobody would ever spend a lot of money to option my book uh, because in a lot of people's minds, this is a very niche market. It is, however, a niche market that's been around for 20 years and continues to grow every time a, a new pre-adolescent or adolescent kid stumbles across the show uh, in the backwaters of, uh, of streaming video. And I wanted more control over it, and I wanted to be able to sort of push it as hard as I could on my own terms. And also, I knew I would get uh, uh, a bigger piece of each sale if I did it myself. So... So how did Book Baby win your business? There's, there's lots of different self-publishing companies out there. Uh, you know, I did a lot of research. I And Book Baby seemed the friendliest and also had a very strong, um, you know, technical support team. And also um, everybody there is incredibly good looking, I'm told. Uh, you're the first person whose face I've actually seen. It could be a lie. I don't know. Uh, I don't know if you know that your signature file goes out saying Book Baby, the best looking people in the book business. <laughs> it does. Um I think that's true. Uh, it's it also on the side of our building, too. Is it? Yeah, it's a it, it's a good looking set of letters together. So I would assume it would extend everybody's face as well. Uh, I also knew somebody who um, had recently published a book with Book Baby, and they were also very pleased. So between the recommendations and the research, I figured you know, um, Book Baby didn't suck was my analysis, and that <laughs> turned out to be, uh, be pretty much true. Yeah, that is actually uh, going to be our new motto: is Book Baby doesn't suck. You know, that's in, in today's world, you can't put a small <laughs> price on that. So what is the reaction been to your book? What does this dedicated audience think? Uh, the dedicated audience has been, I'll say, overjoyed. Um, and uh, I, have, I haven't been stalked yet, so I'm looking forward to that. Um, but people have been really happy about it. They've been happy about the, you know, hearing the behind the scenes stories. Uh, a lot of people are very happy just to see scripts. You know, that was something when I was growing up, I really loved reading scripts from TV shows. I, you know, remember a, a book about the making of the trouble with tribbles, the star Trek episode by, by David Gerald. And it contained, uh, samples of the script from in the episode. I thought that was the most fascinating thing as, as a kid to just sort of, see this blueprint that the show was made from and how it changed and all that sort of thing. So uh, people have been very, uh, very positive. Nobody's gotten angry at me, um, which is a very good thing in this group. So how are you connecting with your fan base now during quarantine? Um, knocking on doors. Why? <laughs> um, 
coughing on all their faces. <laughs> coughing on all their faces. Uh, yeah, sometimes I'll just lick something and leave it at their door. Um, what's happening apart from you know various internet ads I'm taking out and so that is that I'm finding myself being uh, there's a fair number of now online conventions now that conventions in person have been canceled um, including you know San Diego Comic-Con which is huge and um, you know New York Comic-Con there's actually going to be an Invader Zim Con happening in Boston in August which has of course been canceled and a lot of these people are stepping in to do virtual online panels uh, you know and even online autograph sessions and I've been able to reach a lot of people uh, that way um, you know, uh, just by able, just by promoting it in, in that regard. Um, I haven't, you know, had to stand on a corner with a bullhorn asking people to buy it. It, it hasn't been anything like that. Um, and also, you know, I'll say that internet ads, Facebook ads, just these little things are a very small way that you can reach the people who are most likely to read your book. Um, as much as I uh, have mixed feelings about advertising on Facebook, but I'm not spreading any political lies, so you know I, I don't feel like I'm part of the problem. So what are you working on now? Uh, actually, uh, a couple of things. I'm working on uh, a pitch for an animated series. Well, I'm not working on it. It's done. I'm pitching it around uh, with a voice actor friend of mine and an artist. Um, we're also working on another project from a... Uh, an animated producer uh, uh, in it's weird when you're uh, just sort of a working writer in this business of things that fall into your lap. Um, yeah. So, you, you know, you may cut you may as well. You might cut this whole part out because I don't know if it's that interesting. Yeah. A, a guy from Brazil who had a, an animated series that he tried pitching to North America has come to myself and another writer of mine to try to adapt it for North America because the way it is now, it probably doesn't translate outside of uh, outside of Brazil. And maybe we should just cut that piece completely. So I'll start over because uh, I don't think it's interesting. It's a little weird. Not that he'd hear it, but there we go. Um, yeah, I, the life of a working writer is you're constantly pitching and you're constantly uh, writing new stuff. You know, I have a, a little show targeted towards kids and it's about urban magic. It's called Magic Stuff and we've been pitching it around. We're getting interest um, from a lot of people in Canada, actually. And we will see where that goes. But part of uh, the life of a working writer is... It's like they say, uh, as an actor, getting the job is the job. So you spend a lot of time searching for that next little thing. Um, and then when you get it is when you sort of settle into actually practicing that craft thing that you've been doing for so long. Uh, whether or not I do volume two of the script book is still an open question. Uh, if enough people ask me for it, I'll do it. And if I do, I will probably focus on the scripts that I co-wrote with Jonah Vasquez, which means I would have to actually tell truthful things about him rather than making stuff up for the book. Or we could just let him also tell lies. I could also let him tell lies. Yeah, actually, that's probably more likely what will happen <laughs> is there will just be even more and more lies, but lies from two people and... Uh, I think that's going to be great. All right. So one of, one of Hollywood's surest bets, of course, is the reboot. So is there more Zim to come in the future? Okay. This is, um, uh, as you Breaking may or may not there. know. Well, no, no, no. This is, this is maybe something I'm not supposed to talk about. And that what I'm not supposed to talk about is, that, is the answer is no um, <laughs> so far. But as you know, there was recently the movie uh, on, on Netflix, uh, Invaders Zim Enter the Florpus, which got 100% on Rotten Tomatoes. And what I think I may not be allowed to talk, supposed to talk about, but there's no one telling me I shouldn't, is that after that went up, after that was, you know, released to uh, critical acclaim and uh, rave reviews from the fans who weren't nitpicking stuff, because that's what fans do, um, nobody got in contact with Jonin from either Nickelodeon or Netflix to even say, like, hey, congratulations, hey, we did this. Nobody did. It was just sort of dead silence, and partially is because I think the executive who'd been in charge of that had been shifted out during a regime change before it actually aired. But even so, there was nothing. It was a weird silence that I, in my head, I can only attribute to everybody else thinking somebody else was in charge of it. So I think that everyone is always open to doing new Zim. Um, I think Nickelodeon is open to it. I suspect Netflix would be open to it. But I think it may be, as it's been in the past, sort of up to the fans to keep reminding them that this show is here and uh, it's a really good show. And we just did something. And by we, I, you know, Jonin wrote that script. I was a script consultant uh, on it, but just did something that 
people really loved and got really great reviews and there's no reason not to consider doing something else in that vein. So uh, there are no plans, but the way I know that networks work is that a plan can happen again in a heartbeat if the right people are behind it. Uh, you never know. I mean, this show looked like it was gone forever once and then it sort of rose from the grave. So there's no reason it can't rise from the grave again. All right. Well, good luck and thanks for joining me. Oh, thank you. Very, very happy to be here. Thanks again. All right. Well, that was Eric Trueheart, television writer and book baby author. If you'd like to be published alongside one of the minds that brought the world Invader Zim, we'd love to hear from you. Our staff is available at info at bookbaby.com. And if you enjoyed the podcast, please take the time to subscribe, follow, rate, like, and share it. Thanks to Eric for joining me today. And to our producer, Brian Lipsky, I'm your host, Sam Sedan, and this has been the Book Baby Spotlight.